When I was young, it felt like my father knew the answers to everything. So one day, I asked him about a science word I heard when I was watching TV. Entropy. He said, yes, that's entropy. That's when big, complicated things that should be holding together fall apart. They fall everywhere. But it's nobody's fault. Doing go-rounds on Sunday nights, it was real quiet in town. Driving around, almost no calls would ever come in. So it was just me behind the wheel, street after street. I had too much time and quiet to think, really. I didn't even listen to music or anything. And then Mitzi from the detention center told me that one statistic she knew. She loved to hit me with funny statistics. And that one never got out of my head on Sunday nights. I, I got it off the internet or something. So maybe someone just pulled it out of one of their orifices. I don't know. But it was something like, if you took the population of any town and divided it by some number, you were guaranteed that a certain number of houses in the middle of the night had something totally awful and terrible and illegal going on. It's just basic math. But I said, Pat, you have to take a joke, baby. <laughs> he took everything so seriously. That man was wired tight. So somewhere in Claysmith on Sunday night, you could safely say three houses were definitely hiding something... Uh, Kind of unthinkable. That's what that meant. Some violent, secret thing. You just couldn't ever tell which houses they were, even though I knew the town as well as anybody. I guess I went right past them for hours. Sometimes I'd see a light in a window and images would go through my mind. It was a made-up fact, maybe, but it didn't need to be technically true to bother me. I got pulled over on High Street for no brake lights, which, you know, was really frustrating. Uh, it was like the one cop in town, he saw me, he pulled me over, probably because he was just bored. I don't know. Me and Kev, we were kind of, we were kind of fighting a little. A couple minutes pass. It's like three minutes after we said goodnight to the Mr. Lonely Hearts cop. So we're driving away and we're talking about how in the world I was going to pay this ticket. And there goes, walking down the side of the road, some guy pushing something on a hand truck. This, this hand truck with two wheels and big tires. We use them all the time at the G&G, scoot boxes around the warehouse, you know. Like, this guy was making a delivery or something in the middle of the night. It was real late. Big, tall thing. And Kev keeps hassling me, but then he stops. And there's this funny silence, and he goes, Did you see what that guy was pushing? You know, I should mention that by the time we were talking about this, we had passed, like, time had passed, right? And I kind of laughed. I kind of forgot Kev was such a moron for a minute, because this thing had to be mentioned straight up. And I was like, yeah, I think I saw what he was pushing, but uh, that can't be right. It was like we had a delayed reaction, I, I thought it was a, a prop from some Halloween thing. That's what anybody would think if they were normal. Because Halloween had been a couple of days before. Never in a zillion years would anybody, right? Any, any average person, what have you. I don't know. Where my house is, we're all lined up in the back on an alley. It's pretty nasty. There's a couple of uh, condemned places. It's... It's really just a dirt track, barely big enough to get your car down to your place or walk your dog. And my bedroom window looks down on part of it. So when I can't sleep, I'll sit at my desk in there and I'll write... It, well, porn, frankly. Porn is... that's what I was actually doing around about a midnight. And and I saw the guy pushing that contraption down the alley. He had a wheeled um, 
the the thing UPS guys use a hand cart thing. At first, I figured it was a piece of furniture, but it was so big he had to kind of let the back of it rest against his shoulders as he pushed. Otherwise, maybe it would get him balanced. He was definitely struggling a little. So I was watching this, and then I finally realized what it was. I can't sit here and pretend I was going to raise any alarm bells or anything, because what am I going to say if I call the police? How am I going to know what the laws are about owning that kind of thing? He pushed it right by the alley, dumps out on Conrack. So I guess he still had a ways to go at that point. We didn't really say anything about it because, like, what was there to say? We saw somebody with a Halloween decoration. Like, we're not gonna waste anybody's time with that, you know? Yeah. So no. Uh, we, we don't feel any guilt about not saying anything. I had a lot going on. I was trying to get my herbalist certification. Let me explain the sequence of actual events in order so people perhaps finally understand. One, Mr. Dunker applied for the trial based on a recommendation from his mental health provider. Second, that recommendation went to the panel and he was approved after a questionnaire and an examination. And it all show that he went through eight doses total between July and October, five milligrams each time, and all the proper fasting requirements were met. There's no way for him to have abused a drug because it was administered only at the Cheney Link lab site. And the records there were, uh, were all found to be solid and accurate. Third, our company takes procedures very seriously. In 2014, we were given the National Academy of Strategic Scientists Award for protocol design. Wrongdoing came strictly from Port Biopharma. Four, contrary to some people's belief, we did not possess the power to teleport our eyes into the future and magically visualize their misconduct. Contrary to some people's apparent belief, no such magical teleporting device existed at that time. Sai was just one of those people who puts on a perfect face for other people. There was nothing scheming about it. It's adapting. I think I was the only one at the shop who knew about the buttons and coins thing. We just saw this guy, this really friendly guy. He was outgoing, a climber, always in shape. He liked people, he was a good boss. But it was like 10 years he'd been fighting with that anxiety. He explained it all to me once. He tried to go through CBT, which cognitive behavioral therapy. But the way he described it, it was, it was rough. It was too rough for him. You'd never know how he was trying to keep things together. You'd never know at a party that he was sweating it out inside because you accidentally rattled some quarters in your pocket or you took some change out when you were paying the tab somewhere. Or you'd look up and notice Sai had left something real early. Maybe it was because someone had, you know, buttons lined up in a certain way on their shirt. You just wouldn't know. He was too proud to tell about it unless you drew it out somehow. The human brain, man. I mean, what a mess. The stadium was always the low point of the circuit around town. I honestly dislike going there pretty intensely. Something about the place, as small as it was, it felt like a haunted house. But it had to be done at least once a month or so because there were so many ways into it that invited transients or kids doing drugs or something worse. I told myself, you gotta go in there right after Halloween. The time we found a dead horse in there. Fully grown dead horse. I got an alderman to yell for a barrier fence, but nothing ever happened. What was left of the bread factory had a fence, but not the stadium. I had keys, so I went in the main entrance and I checked out the concourse. It was just a half a loop, but a lot of nooks and corners, raccoons, and that big Clay Smith City Kickers banner that no one ever had the interest to steal. Probably because the league went bankrupt before the team even started. 
Some rain had come through about a half hour before, so there were these trickles of dripping water coming down, like some cavern system. And then I walked outside into the bowl, and I did a visual scan from where I stood of the bleacher planks all around just to see if there were any uh, anomalies, which meant someone sleeping there. I think it was the field that always spooked me the most, really. It was like the end of the world kind of sight. They mowed only when they thought about it. The grass was up to my calves now. Something about the stadium, that grass and all that quiet, you know? For whatever reason, it always reminded me of Jonestown, somehow. Okay, so the honking bullshit starts when you have Port once again pressuring us to keep expanding the trial pool, when all along we tell them, look, Darth Vader, we can't find this optimal set of patients you're describing in the time frame you need. No one can. It doesn't exist. It reads great in your marketing materials, but you're eliminating too much of the set if you want to achieve reliable data. So you wind up nuancing the qualifications and the questionnaire. Dump this question, dump this question, and you keep doing that, and bingo! You wind up with someone with previous damage to the mesolimbic pathway from a surgery when he was two, and only through x-rays are you going to see that's still there. So that should have been caught. And then you have probable evidence showing in the ventral striatum after the third five milligrams that his f***ing dopaminergic signals are getting corrupted. And Darth tells you it's a statistical outlier, and we'll examine it closely when the trial is done. No. How about you pull him in for a real evaluation right now, instead of nodding your heads like a bunch of f***ing parrots when he tells you he's feeling fine? And maybe consider whether his very response to that question is completely causal. But see, fine is what they want to hear. So Boba Fett can give everyone good news about the drug in their stockholders meeting. But what am I supposed to do when this is so f***ing chronic? Be a hero? Tell my mother she has to move into a state home? We can't afford a private one anymore? Then try to explain why I left my last job to somebody else on the Death Star? I radioed Porter on schedule, pretty routine, and he let me know he'd seen something a little unusual sometime before. This guy standing near the Salvation Army store, looking a little out of it. That was his exact description. He was dropping something into the storm drain, some little thing. And I asked Porter what the guy's story was. Well, Porter didn't know. Porter hadn't pulled over and asked him any questions. I said, Porter, you're going to be out here for hours every night. This isn't some place like Philadelphia. There's no reason to let anything slide. And he said, well, the guy had something on a hand truck, some cabinet or something. So obviously he was in the middle of doing something. Porter was about four months out of the academy. He was still in that false mode of thinking. He didn't know yet that you have to separate the context sometimes. He let that hand truck blind him. You have to think, what about the person am I seeing here? You see a brand new iPhone in Jack the Ripper's hand and he's sitting in Starbucks texting. He's still Jack the Ripper when he opens his mouth and you really look into his face. I just thought I was one of the lucky ones, probably. There were so many duds on that app. And here was this really charming, upbeat New Haven guy, owned his own business, made things for a living. And the one time we went out, he was, you know, really fun, totally respectful. I didn't mind that he was divorced. You know, everyone else was. He talked about it like he and his ex were pretty friendly. So I was sad. He didn't call me back. I waited and waited, and it just wasn't happening. Not that I was going to fight it, because I know what it's like out there. I absolutely know about cold feet. I just thought we had enough of a connection that he'd call me. And then he finally did, like a month later, pretty much out of the blue. And to him, he treated it like it was like only a few days had gone by. I said, sure, I'll go out again. His sense of time seemed like it was a little wonky, like he'd just kind of lost track. But considering who some of my girlfriends wound up with on that app, these guys with their Batman Lego sets, he, he was pretty much a dream. 
maybe I was the only one who really noticed him changing, but I don't know. That, that kind of seems hard to believe. But he started to seem kind of secretive. You know, he was spending a lot more time in his office, and now the door was closed sometimes for some reason. And this was a guy who practically pioneered the open door thing. A lot of time on the internet, that's what it seemed like, you know? A lot of internet secrecy during the day. He still kept to his usual schedule pretty much, but now he wasn't helping us out on the floor. And that was always something he kind of dug. It was pretty amazing to watch him put something together. He knew his stuff. The other thing that sunk in quick was that when you were talking to him, okay, he would get this super intense look of concentration on his face. Usually when you talk to Sai, he was kind of smiling and nodding helpfully, right? Now he'd almost twist his face to follow what you were saying, almost like a little puppy does. Like He'd tilt his head like that cartoon mouse from the cereal commercials, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm trying to do it, but it seems stupid when I do it. His, like, his, his features would scrunch up, you know? Then it would pass. I just couldn't put my finger on what was going on. There was a Chevy Impala on the side of the road with the driver's side door wide open and the flashers on. The side of Thick Whistle Road. There's absolutely nothing around that area. Just a pig farm a mile up. There's a lot of woods. A lot of woods. I took a look around and then I ran the plates. I recognized the name that came up. Garth Rizzo. That was interesting. He was in Toastmasters with me for a little while. I'd been out to his house a couple of times on domestic calls. It was his son who called in both times to tell us his dad was beating on him. Sad. The kid was 22, 23. Garth Rizzo was that kind of guy. I tried to start the car. The keys were still there and it wouldn't turn over. Not enough electrical power. Everything was pretty much gone, except for the headlights and flashers, which were real weak, and the radio would play for about 10 seconds and then die. So I figured his alternator had started to cock, but he kept driving, maybe trying to get all the way home, which would have been about another two miles away still. Since it was so late, I thought it meant maybe he was drunk in the bargain. Then I noticed that the headrest on the driver's seat, the cushion, was partially dislodged from the post, like someone had tried to yank it out. We'd call it sustainability of the delivery chain. That was the magic blame phrase. It meant absolutely horse We'd use that as the reason we couldn't procure decent parts for the alternator. But the reality was, it was pretty much planned to fail at a certain mileage mark. The alternator, the fuel pump, the water pump, we had a 10-year contract with Convexity Midwest to supply the parts to the car care centers. So, of course, those parts couldn't last. Uh, my whole job was more or less shopping for parts you could always get from suppliers at an obscenely low price. Didn't depend on any kind of improvement cycle getting in the way of pure crapitude. So when your car broke down on your way to grandma's, guess what? That was me sitting in my office in Phoenix, calculating your fate on a spreadsheet. That was my light cyan column. I always loved coloring in the little cells in Excel. That never got old. That's what I left teaching for. I figured I'd just go right down to Garth's and see if he wound up home. I'd been there one time for a New Year's thing. I went up on the porch, knocked a couple of times, and the door kind of opened in by itself. No one even seemed to touch it. It was dark inside and there was a deep red light somewhere. It was so powerful it lit up the hallway and like a dream or a movie, this shape came around the corner. Just a total silhouette of a man in all that red light wearing a cape Clearly with a big collar, you know, that very classy vampire look. This person walking toward the door very slowly, like nothing I could have expected. Then I saw it was Spencer, Garth's kid, skinny kid. 
He had his hair slicked back. His face looked pale. Maybe some makeup to get it that way. And he told me that it was only a game. Some internet game he was playing. But he kept on talking like someone much older, much wearier. He didn't want to break character or something. So it was a little unnerving because I wasn't sure exactly who I was talking to. He told me his dad had never come home that night. And he didn't sound surprised. Garth had been seeing some woman recently. I really wanted to give this kid a shake and say, come on, I need to speak to the real Spencer, please. But he was immersed. I could have asked to come inside, but I didn't quite have cause yet. And when we were done, he turned and drifted back into the light and out of sight, just as slow as he'd come. Probably being whatever he was supposed to be was much, much better than being Garth Rizzo's son. I'd seen a lot of that. Cy called me in to talk about something. I think it was a bed frame that was going to be next to impossible to get done on time, something like that, but almost right away he got off that topic and he said to me, we were sitting just like we are now, you know, he was behind his desk, he said, let me ask you something, have you ever done anything really, really terrible that nobody would understand? And I said, uh, I don't know exactly what I said. I mentioned being really mean to someone in Boy Scouts once who totally didn't deserve it, I just picked a fight with him for no reason whatsoever bloodied up his lip pretty bad. I still actually feel bad about that. Sai wanted more and more details, though. I asked him, what was this about? And he said, think of the worst being, the worst monster in the world. It would be the devil, right? It would be Satan. And I said, yeah. He said, theoretically, if he was inside one of us, how would that person know? How would you know if you were Satan? I'm pretty sure I laughed, but it's your boss, right? You're not going to talk to your boss in certain ways, even if you're friendly. So I play along, even though I'm getting really confused at this point. He said, I think if a person were Satan, he'd know because he could get away with the worst possible thing you could do and keep on going, right? That sounded plausible enough to me, so I said so. And he said, so you'd try to do that awful thing and see if it felt good enough to keep going. And if absolutely no one could stop you, well, there's your answer, right? Does that sound right? I forget the exact words, but it was something freaky like that. And I said, Sai, I gotta know, what in the world is this about? You're weirding me out, man. And there came that look that I was talking about. Like, uh, like he was concentrating so hard it almost hurt. And then it passed, and he said something about, like, oh, he'd just been reading some philosophy book and wanted to know if I was into that kind of thing. He was just throwing it out there. That was way over my head. Very weird. You know, because we'd only really ever talked about sports or our kids or TV shows. Everything else I knew about him came from other people or other places. We just sort of ended it there and I went back to the floor and he stayed in his office. Door closed again. That had become his normal. I drove back to Garth's car. I was going to call a tow if I had to. I was looking at the GPS a little to double confirm there really wasn't any place for Garth to have gone that wasn't a residence. I popped the trunk, and really the reason was exactly what you might think, which is the one in a million chance that you're going to find someone in there. Never happened to me, but you always take a breath before you open a trunk. But instead, it was totally crammed with cardboard boxes, and inside those boxes were much smaller boxes. Pregnancy test kits are an item that happens to uh, retain their price points very well when they're sold illegally online, especially overseas. So we see them stolen from the warehouses quite a bit. Not as much as adult diapers, interestingly. Porter radioed me again. He'd just taken a call from Mota Street. Someone was saying they thought they heard a scream from the house next door, and then everything had gone real quiet. So now they were worried. They admitted they waited a good half hour before calling. That wasn't too surprising. People tend to wait until the primitive part of their brains really starts crying out. I told Porter to swap places with me. 
It was getting on toward 2.30. We met at Rustic Steakhouse for our second date. And he was talking about very different things than the first time. A lot about stuff from my past he wanted to know about. Nothing too invasive, just strange. It felt like he was trying to figure out if I might be a killer or something. He hadn't been like that on the first date. Then he really got weird. He started to talk about how he had this big plan, like nothing anyone had ever seen. And I was like, you mean a business plan? And he said, no, what he meant was, I don't know. He was talking about being more powerful than anyone in the world. And he realized there was only one way to prove it. And unless he did it, good and evil would get out of balance. I mean, really ludicrous talk and it, felt like he was trying to make it into some puzzle I had to guess at and I felt really uncomfortable with it then he asked me this was only part of the way through dinner he asked me to look into his eyes and tell him what I saw there wasn't flirtatious or even nice but he was all like oh no faith there's no reason to be afraid you're going to be able to tell everyone who you encountered in this life. I made up some ridiculous lie about how I had to go. Really, totally unbelievable, but he bought it. I think I was crying before I even got out of the restaurant, but I was more scared than sad at that point. That was three years ago, and I haven't dated since. I swear, it's like having some lousy part-time job you have to keep dragging yourself to at night instead of relaxing and then every time you get your paycheck it's just 40 cents or sometimes it's all zeros and then at the bottom someone actually wrote you're worth nothing i'll tell you how gullible people are day one we loaded the app up with fake profiles one fake for every 15 real ones what they'd figured out was that People don't mind getting no response from a hot person's profile. They were used to getting rejected by hot people. But if they didn't see enough of them in the feed, that was what they got disappointed by. That's where the cancel rate came from. These Autobot responses all had the same dopey pattern, but it was forever till someone actually called us out on it. We didn't even try hard with the photos. They were all from the last couple of search pages on the Serbian version of Photoswan. It was just laziness that got us found out. We kept accidentally giving all of our hot people the same names. It was either like uh, Zach or Sheridan. Cranberry was the nice side of town. There was some money in Cranberry. It was rare we got calls there. The neighbor who'd made the call was standing on her lawn in the dark. She raised her hand to me when I pulled up and pointed toward 146. We didn't have any kind of exchange beyond that. wasn't necessary yet. I knocked on the door a few times. No answer. All the lights were off, so I walked around the side. The neighbor was watching me. She had this enormous cup of tea or something she had to hold in both hands. She'd bring it up to her mouth real slow and sip and watch me. I couldn't see her face. The sliding glass door out to the porch was open. I took a step inside, called out. It was the living room. There were candles lit inside. There was a video camera set up. It was pointed at a table. And on the table was an Ouija board next to a bunch of other candles. Real classical setup there. Except there was also a rubber tie-off and some cotton balls beside it. The needle that went with it had been left on the mantel. I kept calling and calling. And I walked through the house a bit, but no one was answering. No one was in the bedroom. The door leading into the kitchen from the backyard was unlocked too and it felt just a little bit greasy to the touch. 
Sai didn't come to work the day after Halloween. He just sent us an email. So the last time I ever saw him, I guess, was mm, October 30th. When everyone went home on the 1st, I hung around for a while. There were these ridiculous arch door jams I had to fit. And at some point, I went out to one of the little storage units we have around the back of the shop. I went toward the back of this one unit we hadn't used for a while because of a flooding problem. I was looking for a certain mullion shape. And there was all this stuff spread out on a big work table. I thought, well, this is a strange place for somebody to be working on something. Well, why wouldn't they do it in the shop? So I, you know, obviously I took a closer look. I figured out how to roll the tape back on the camera, or I guess it's not tape anymore, it's all digital. And I played it through the little screen on the video camera. There was an older guy sitting at the table, there in the dark in front of the Ouija board. This was Mr. Worthy, and he was looking all around him, and he was asking questions of nobody in particular. He definitely looked inebriated, or stoned is the better word. I let the video play while I kept checking out the room. I thought maybe I'd get lucky and hear something on it. And on the video, he kept saying, Do you understand why I had to do it, darling? He said that over and over so often that I couldn't concentrate. I went to fast forward the video, but it ended real quick. When I rolled it back a little, I got the sense that he'd seen something in the far corner of the room. He wasn't expecting, and he stopped what he was doing, and then he'd gotten up from the chair and moved out of frame. And he just started to say something new when you could get a sense of the weight of his steps on the floor, jostle the camera a little, and you heard his hand tap it, and the recording stopped. Size sketches never look like anybody else's. They were really distinctive because they were actually kind of bad. But he always had it all up in his mind, right? That's how good a carpenter he was. He didn't need sketches most of the time. They just looked to me like a lot of random joints and edges. All that was left of whatever he was building was wood scraps and some bolts. And he would dragged a workmate in. Except plain as day, right there on the rack next to it were these cut steel pieces, real big. He put a black X on them with a grease pen, which is what we would do in the shop to mark stuff to be recycled. They didn't seem to mean much until you touched the bottom edges. They had been sharpened and sharpened and sharpened. They were as sharp as you can possibly get without slicing your finger open just by touching one. When I was 12, the bread factory burned down. And my father came home with a burn on his neck that he thought was nothing to worry about. But it was a lot more serious than he realized. He'd risked his life that night. I remember stopping on my bike sometimes on the way to the snack and go, looking at the scary, sagging ruins and all that gray ash that took so long to finally blow away, little by little. But it was how angry the people in town got with each other over who was to blame for the fire that actually scared me. Seeing Gary Fair get beaten up by a mob because of it was what finally got me to really start thinking about entropy. There were all kinds of little things in the living room that were confusing the picture. I noticed that the mirrors were taped over. There were two of them there in the living room, and they were done over really carefully with electrical tape. There was a junction bay alarm system in the house that was activated, but the sensor light was yellow. I'd only seen them green before. That stuck with me, too. I went out through the sliding glass door again and took a look at the grass out under the roof light. And there you could kind of see it if you squatted and looked at the right angle. Because of the rains that night, there were what looked like drag marks. I was able to follow the traces out almost all the way to the edge of the lawn. Robert would do the installations, but that first test in front of the customer wasn't actually for the connection to the base. That had to be tested after the account for the phone line was confirmed. And of course, 
the first one for 146 Moda failed because Robert usually has his head up his ass. But then I look at the account and I see the test signal went out 1015 at night. And nobody wants to call the customer about a fail that late because they get all pissy. So what you do sometimes is just wait till the next morning. Because I figured, well, it's the first test. What are the odds someone's actually going to trespass before we get this fixed? But then, because of all the layoffs, it was just me that morning and I have a million things to do. And then Big Round Boss comes out of his office and he's like, Me, Big Round Boss! Me need you get cake from Safeway! And I said, seriously? We're doing Nisha's birthday when we have all this stuff we need to do we can't get to? But I go and it turns out Big Round Boss can't even spell Nisha over the phone right to the cake people. So it reads, Happy Birthday, Nichi. And I think, oh well! But Big Round Boss sees it and goes, Me, Big Round Boss! You need scrape letters off! I have work to do. And then I see him in his office. He's using his disgusting nail clippers to try to do surgery on the letters. So I definitely couldn't have been happier that this guy made three times what I did. You have accessed the eArchiva Law Enforcement Media Database. Chapter E337P, November 6th, 2023. 1840 hours. Okay, we can set the map aside for a bit. Do you want to tell us about Mr. Rizzo? Well, I was driving down the road and I hadn't quite figured out a definite plan yet. And I saw the car stopped on the shoulder and I looked around and I thought, well, this is as good a chance as any. The guy was obviously alone. He was closing his hood. There was nobody else around. It looked like kind of a deserted road, so I, I, I pulled over as close as I possibly could, and I uh, reached beside me, and I took the taser off the passenger seat, but I hadn't really thought of how to conceal it, so I really just had it in my left hand as I walked up. Uh, I said, hey, do you need any help? And I saw how big the guy was, and I thought, okay, this could be tough. And the first thing he said to me was, uh, I, I am going to find the people who made this pile of pus and I am going to shoot holes in every single one of them. Uh, so I said, uh, what, do you, what do you think the problem is? Do you need a jump? And he said, no, I don't need a jump. I need a new alternator. So unless you have one to give away, why don't you go screw your mother? I thought, wow. So I put the taser up against his neck, and I, it worked better than I thought. What did it do to him? He fell to the ground. He kind of uh, grabbed at the headrest of the driver's seat to break his fall. He was twitching, and he kept saying, what, 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 over and over again, like his, his mouth had got stuck in gear, and I, I tased him a couple more times, and I told him if he stayed still, I'd stop. I'm not even sure he heard me by that point. I think I overdid it. His arms were totally limp, so I, I laid him out kind of like a, a snow angel. And I got the zip ties on his hands and his legs pretty quick, and I realized, you know what, I, I, I hope I can figure out how to use the lift gate on the truck, because this guy looks like he's tipping 250 pounds. And I'd never used one before, and I, I forgot to read up on it at the shop. But I, I made sure to park with the truck's rear end right next to Please where door. he'd been standing and they, they mark it on the dash very clearly one, one button all I had to do was roll him onto it more or less before anyone else came along and that didn't turn out to be a problem I, I knew there were fewer people in Claysmith than there used to be I just didn't realize how few I'd never been there I closed up the house and did a quick circuit of the street but I didn't see much sign of anything worth noting I told Porter to finish up with Garth's vehicle for now and start cruising again. I gave him the whole rundown of the situation at the house, but I couldn't be sure exactly what we were looking for. It was just a half certainty that something was very wrong. I had the alarm company give me what information they could about the owner of the house, see if an alarm signal was sent, but he wasn't picking up on his cell when I tried. So, at that moment, he could have been anywhere. I couldn't believe that neighbor stayed out in her yard the whole time. She didn't want to go back in. 
I practically forced her to. I thought about my daughter. She wasn't at home that night. She was doing a sleepover at a friend's house. Her friend Jackie was very sick. Terminally ill, in fact. So she and another friend were sleeping over there. Play games, cheer her up a little. She was going back in the hospital for a while the next day. It wasn't something we'd normally ever let Barb do on a school night, but that was a special case. There was absolutely no reason for me to think that they weren't all safely asleep. Jackie's folks were there, of course. It would have been ridiculous for me or my wife to suddenly call. But I really wanted to. I just happened to see the Junction Bay sticker in the window as I I drove by. And based on my own history with Junction Bay and how skeezy they were, for lack of a better word, I thought, I bet those people have no security system at all. Junction Bay just unethically sold them a sticker. And that was how I decided on that house, pretty random. Uh, I walked around back to see if there was a door open, and there was. It was unlocked. But I thought I thought I still might have set off an alarm. It looked like there was a box next to it inside on a wall, but nothing seemed to happen. I strolled right in. Everything was really aligning just as I had wanted. I had to curve around the stadium on the east side to go toward Lancaster Road. There are a couple of spots where you have a pretty good glimpse of part of the field itself, but you have to be looking right there to notice it. I'd just been passed so many times I knew those spots real well. I was moving past the stop sign on Mohican and I looked up and suddenly... And you would have to have had seen that sight a thousand times to know that anything was different in the slightest. I saw something on the field. A little blot. My first thought was that it was a person. I put the cruiser in reverse and I idled for a bit. I was just staring at it. The thing wasn't moving. Then what jumped out completely clear was that the big service doors on that side of the stadium had been forced inward. There was this old man in the living room. He was definitely surprised to see me. He said, you can't be here. It's too dangerous for you to be here. He seemed very dazed, greatly under the influence of some kind of drug or alcohol. He had to sit down again or he was going to fall right over And I looked around at the Ouija board and the candles and so forth, and I asked him what he meant, and he said, uh, he said, uh, it's it's me, it's me she wants revenge on, but if you're here, she could kill you too. And I asked him, why have you blacked out the mirrors? And he told me it was too easy for her spirit to leave the room through them, something like that. I, I didn't hear him perfectly clearly. Uh, I said, what do you, what did you do to this person? But he wouldn't answer that. All he did was like this. He kind of slowly brought his hands up to his face and over his eyes like he couldn't bear to look at me. And I went up to him and I put the taser against his neck like the man before. But the reaction was different. He, he screamed very loudly. So I had to hit him and uh, stamp on him so he'd stop. And then he just he went completely limp. I, I didn't think he was breathing. There was no sign of life, almost immediately. He was extremely light, so it was simple uh, to just drag him out of there and across the grass and get him into the back of the truck. I was sure someone in the houses there would see me, but it never happened. You think you might have been dead? Yeah, I was pretty sure. Um, I I figured I could just leave him and, and go back inside and pull the tape off the mirror, so I did that, and then I went back outside. Why did you feel the need to do that? I don't know. It occurred to me that uh, if this spirit he was trying to bring into the house was actually there, she'd be trapped. I don't know how anything like that works. It just seemed like the right thing to do. There's a thrill in sneaking out in the night with your childhood friends like nothing else in life. It's like swimming together in a dark sea of mystery and wonder. 
We'd gone where we'd never dared to go. We were excited to either be caught or not be. We knew what we were doing was wrong, Jackie, Sonia, and I, but we wouldn't have given it up for the world. All we had were the clothes we had on and Sonia's book. The bread factory seemed impossibly far away, but we kept going. We were on an important mission. That's what we told each other. Crossing Sunset Park, I spotted the man, far away, standing where the tree line stopped and the playground began. He was neither walking a dog, nor smoking, nor doing anything but watching us go past. Sonia said, Don't worry, there's three of us and only one of him. And we began to giggle. Our nerves were frayed in a thrilling and terrible way. The man was careful to stand just out of the lamplight, one step in almost any direction, and he would be revealed. We had seen the box truck sitting in the corner of the parking lot. He later said he wanted just one more murder that night. The second one, the old man, had not felt right. And when he saw the three of us, he barely knew what to do. The possibilities were overwhelming. Things were coming together so beautifully for him. Chaos becoming order. Loose pieces on the ground rising and melding. A film reel of mangled, bloody colors becoming a landscape. He put his head in his hands, clutching it, trying to picture and feel it all. He was just too slow in figuring how to go about killing all three of us. The next thing he knew, we were gone in the dark. Those service doors were barely even chained, and it looked from some indentations that a vehicle had simply bumped up against them until the chains had snapped. There wasn't even a locking device. They were just looped over and over and knotted. The area inside there was empty and just big enough to drive something through. The doors on the other side of it were open too. Same deal. Something heavy had struck them. They weren't even chained. Open right out into the open air through a gap in the fence that hugged the field all around. Couldn't have been simpler. There it was standing right at the midfield point where the soccer teams would have kicked off if the league had ever started. It was about five feet tall, and it was actually light enough to rock back and forth with one hand if you were strong. If it had been much heavier, it couldn't have been moved with a hand truck too well, so he'd built it very carefully. I'd never seen one of these things up close except maybe in a museum when I was a kid. This was sort of a more shrunken version, I suppose. If you had room in the truck for it, why did you push it so far on the hand truck from where you first parked? Why not drive it right to the stadium? I didn't even know about the stadium when I first parked. I just wanted to look around for a place I felt good about. And I saw those uh, bleachers way off in the distance. And I, um, I, li I liked this image, this image of, of the whole little town filling up that little stadium, uh, filing in to see. No talking or anything, just quiet. And watching me do what I did. But you didn't drive there. Well, part of it was if I could push it on the hand truck all the way there and no one stopped me, that would be my affirmation that I couldn't be stopped at all. That would be a sign I was who I knew I was. And that turned out to be true. The bodies were lying just on the other side of it. He hadn't just rolled them away when he was done with them. There was some attempt at arrangement, some pattern I didn't understand right away. No, it was just that I had <clears throat> some trouble when I cut the electrical tape off their hands and their mouths. Things got out of sorts. What flavor of Snapple is this supposed to be? The basket was to the left of Mr. Worthy's arm. His arm was outstretched, and his hand was actually touching it. Just a wicker basket from Walmart or someplace. Nothing special. 
Both of the heads were inside, sort of facing each other. When I radioed the state police, I remember my mind had completely blanked on the actual word for what this big thing was. Just one of those moments you hear a word a thousand times and obviously you know it, but suddenly it just won't come. And then it didn't come to me as a sound in my mind. It came to me as this image of tiles on a Scrabble board. That happens sometimes. I play with my wife a lot. And there it was in the tiles. I can even tell you how many points it's worth. Guillotine. 11-point score. I was in year 24 of my career then. That may have been my first time as a police officer looking down into that basket that for some reason my very first sympathies weren't for the victims. Instead, my first thought, standing right there, was someone else has lost their immortal soul. That was getting older talking. I had this weird instant of sadness for some wretched total stranger. And then I went looking to find him. Cy Dunker became disoriented and frustrated and trying to find the box truck again, veering mistakenly to the east. He eventually spotted a patrol cruiser in the distance, waiting at the railroad tracks where the mayor had been killed by a derailed freight car eight years earlier. The cruiser picked him up in the headlights by another fluke of chance. When he saw someone getting out of it, he turned to the north. Very shortly, he realized he was finally being pursued. Porter did a lot of things wrong that night. Trying to cross that mud mess beside Temple Emmanuel and the cruiser was definitely one, which is how he got stuck and wound up on foot so soon. Some of it was bad training. Some of it was adrenaline and being young. He didn't know the town real well, and he didn't realize the old wooden city was a dead end, and he didn't have to go in there after Dunker. Once you got in there, it was almost impossible to navigate your way out unless you came back through the front. But Porter did go in. After the riots in Hartford, the department had two years of awful PR problems. We couldn't recruit officers no matter what we tried. No one wanted to be a cop. So the academy entrance standards fell off a cliff. If you had a face and could count to nine on your toes, you were in. There was this place up ahead and I was getting tired. Strange looking place to me, but the officer was getting closer, so I made for it. I thought, I won't even use the taser. I'll kill him with my bare hands. I really wanted to do that. It seemed like that, that would be a good ending. I would feel good about that. They were so desperate for warm bodies. <laughs> Once I was at a recruiting table up at the college, and this kid went by, and he picked up a flyer out of politeness. And I said, what's your major? And he said, Comparative religions. And I literally said, well, have you thought about applying that knowledge as a patrol officer for New London County? Anyone could get into the old wooden city. There was no real security. The security was the sign that mentioned history. There's no better way to keep teenagers out of a place than the threat of learning something. It was a recreation of the original town settlement. Eight bucks to get in, but at night, no one around. You could squeeze right through the posts out front without much trouble if you really wanted. Porter had never been there before. It was like a weird movie set. All these wooden cabins and farmhouses with thatched roofs and a town council replica and a mill and a little path winding all through it. By the time I got there, of course, it was flooded with lights from the outside. But for Porter, going into any of those buildings would have been like going into a blackout. When you think about it, to sign one of those terrible seven-year indentured contracts and leave home forever and get on a ship for months with all that disease, 
a lot of those people who came over had to be serious lowlifes. But to get donations, we just went with whatever the tourists wanted to believe. Oh, the people who built our town were such brave heroes. And we just lied. We'd be like, oh yeah, it was absolutely never just somebody's violent cousin with a ton of gambling debt. No way. In time, he entered a recreation of the convalescence hospital where settlers first stayed upon getting off a ship from London or Toulon. It was often necessary to lie two to a bed for days or weeks, recovering from the terrible ocean voyage. Volunteers from the Historical Society had spent weeks building the mahogany beds to historical specifications, then lined them up in rows. A large iron crucifix was mounted to a high wall. He stood in the doorway, listening. He felt for light switches, but there were none. Slowly and silently, he reached for the flashlight on his duty belt, but like his window punch and gloves, it was back in his cruiser. I couldn't believe he couldn't see me. I was standing right in the aisle there between all those beds, and I was willing him to walk forward. My intention was to stand there in the dark and not move a muscle. And sure enough, he finally started to walk toward me, but real slow, like like he had no idea I was there. I had merged with the darkness completely. He would take a step and stop. Take a step, then stop. All his senses would have been heightened but God, inside that building with the trees all around the place blocking the sky. You talk about dark. He was right in front of me, like the distance you are from me now. He was right in front of me and I was invisible. And I felt this rush of power like nothing I can really describe. I was a great crystal eagle, I was bursting with wonder, and I lunged. I thought, I can pull his head off. I can do it with my hands. That's what I want. It can be done. He's been brought right to me to do this. They'll ask, how did he do what he did? And I'll say, with these hands. I've been there since and stood where he stood with the lights out to see what it was like. It's a shadow, it's a shadow land. land. Officer Wisconski shot and was off, but he got Dunker pretty much right in the fat part of the inner elbow at close range. That's a completely debilitating wound. When the medics got there, the man's forearm wasn't hanging on by much. That's game, set, and match right there. There are no Jasons or Hannibal Lecters that are going to bounce back from that. Welcome to biology class, motherfucker. <laughs> I started to laugh looking down at it because there just wasn't any pain whatsoever. No pain. I was able to sort of admire this amazing body I inhabit. I just laid there looking up at the ceiling and laughing. I knew I'd heal faster than anyone would realize. I should be half dead, but I'm alive and I'm already giving you this statement. I'm not on any pain medication, nothing. That should really tell you something about who I am. Didn't get to take the officer's head off, though, did you? And we got you, too, looks like. I'm looking at a man who's missing half an arm and isn't going anywhere ever again. Sometimes there's a grander design. Thank you for accessing the eArchiva Law Enforcement Media Database. eArchiva is hiring superstars.
Go to earchiva.com slash careers to take the next step toward your future. Outside the hulking ruins of the bread factory, Jackie read out the corny resurrection ritual we'd found in some young adult novel banned by our school. We waited in the dark and the cold, in reverent silence, for the spirit of the ashes to rise. Our eyes were wide, and our hearts were completely open. But, of course, the spirit did not rise. We had been lied to. Still, we laughed and congratulated ourselves for our courage and for getting so close to that skull-like place full of black sockets and jagged pits and ash that still sometimes swirled in the wind months after the fire. And yes, we did finally get caught. Somehow getting caught made it one of the most profound memories of my childhood, feeling the sweltering force of how much my father cared about me, even in his anger. So, of course, what happened in that climate at the time was that the public was out for blood. You know, it's not like Facebook is going to let anybody see the situation clearly. And the DA was trying to run for re-election or reappointment or whatever. He got swept up in that. He went all out to depict this guy as a cold-blooded killer instead of somebody who was just screwed by the drug pirates destroying his brain chemistry. It was a total circus. And the next thing you know, they find the guy guilty and they give him like 12,000 years in jail instead of just putting him in a mental hospital. And you know, there was a podcast about it and Netflix did a thing, blah, blah, blah. It got really old in a hurry. That's how I found out that Netflix stopped running DVDs, actually. So they can burn in hell, too. Seems like I read an article or maybe it was on YouTube or something where during the trial, I think it was that trial, one of the scientists who worked for Port Biopharma completely snapped because of all the bad decisions that he was forced to make over the years. And then he barged into the CEO's office and he put a gun to the CEO's head and he pulled the trigger and nothing happened. And it was because someone at the gun maker had bought all these thousands of faulty firing pins from Russia to get a kickback because he knew he was leaving the job anyway. Something like that. Just a complete corruption festival. It's not like there's angels everywhere you turn, you know? I swear, sometimes I think I'm gonna be that person that moves to some backwater town where there's like a total of 12 people so I don't have to deal with anyone ever again. Some real small town where everyone's just got their heads down and they go to work and then they chill the hell out. I just don't know what I do on weekends. Growing up, he would always remind me that no matter how mad the world might seem, there would always be people who didn't hesitate to stand up, be the ones who stood for reason and logic and calm, be the builders. In every time of history... He once said, across all the eras, there would always be a certain percentage in all the quiet houses around us of the strong. Just basic math. And because of this, the world was never quite completely lost. I saw him as one of those people, and he has never wavered. Now I wake up each day and try to be what he is in my own small way. I drive to my lab every morning at 7 and I study the science of things breaking down. And when I can, I try to stitch them back together, quietly and dutifully. Some of it is misplaced nostalgia, maybe. A dream of restoring order to the chaos that broke my friend Jackie's small body, or even bringing the town I grew up in back to life as well. But every time I go back there to visit and walk those fields, it seems more and more like that just can't happen. It doesn't get me down, though. 
There's a motto written in grease marker on the glass wall of my office. We repeat it often here. We laugh about it in meetings. The words read, It's okay. Entropy is nobody's fault. Okay, Mr. Dunker, I'm going to go ahead and let you speak at this point. I probably shouldn't, but I think it might be a very long time before you get another chance. This will be strictly for the court record. You understand it's not going to change anything. We are not going to be making any alterations to your situation today. I'm satisfied by the many medical opinions submitted that the A54 originally introduced into your system has not been a factor in your actions for years and hasn't been since 2023 and is not to blame for the murder of your cellmate, Mr. Dorn. I don't understand your persistent evil any more than anyone else does. Frankly, I don't know if I want to hear what you have to say. But if you want to speak, I will allow it. I don't know what else to add, Your Honor. Uh, I believe I am the devil, and I will prove it again. Maybe you are, buddy. Yes. Okay. We're adjourned. Everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Your Honor.